I'm gonna be honest. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Maybe it's the submissive in me, but I used to really enjoy watching UFC fights. Like, I'm totally against violence or whatever, but like, them shorts though. You know, they say the part of your brain that perceives pleasure is incredibly close to the part of your brain that perceives pain. <laughs> And I guess that might have been what our protagonist had in mind when they decided to start a fight club at their high school in order to get laid. PJ and Josie are two lesbian best friends entering their senior year of high school, and together they make a pact to lose their virginity before they hit graduation. When their car accidentally brushes up against the popular football player Jeff, he feigns this really dramatic injury, and a rumor spreads that they actually beat him up. So naturally, the entire school wonders how exactly they managed to beat up the lead football player. When they get called into the principal's office, the two girls come up with the brilliant idea to say that it was all just a simple misunderstanding that actually what they were doing was um practicing for uh you know their feminist um pro-woman uh self-defense class that they totally organize and run and of course this is complete bullshit so now they are tasked with actually making this self-defense club for women a reality and they realize that a fight club is the perfect opportunity for them to get a little bit closer physically to some of the girls that they're attracted to now, the club isn't successful at first, but it grows and grows in popularity. I mean, girls from different walks of life are all coming to the club. There's even a black Republican girl. And eventually it does catch the attention of the cheerleaders, which was ultimately their goal. See, Josie and PJ actually have a crush on some of the cheerleaders, one of whom actually is dating Jeff. And all of this was just a ruse in order to get closer to them. The club becomes so successful that it gets the attention of the football players who dig a bit deeper into the club and ultimately end up exposing why the club was made. Naturally, a lot of the girls who joined the club are really heartbroken. This had been like a really therapeutic space and they feel sort of taken advantage of. And so they decide to go their separate ways. But at the very end of the film, the girls all come back together to fight against the rival football team who they find out actually plans to leave the football game with blood on the field, I'll just say. And that is essentially a quick summary of the film Bottoms. Bottoms is a delightfully campy and sapphic film that is written and directed by Emma Seligman and co-written by Rachel Sennett, who also happens to play PJ in the film. To be honest, I went into this film with really no idea what it was gonna be about. I just knew it was gonna be gay and that was enough for me. I thought that it was gonna be a film about being a bottom. Like I thought that this was going to be a film about different bottoms, you know, going through like bottom identity struggles, right? Like looking at the poster, I, I thought that this was just gonna be like, you know, basically sisterhood of the traveling pants, but with, with bottoms. I was about to feel like really like related to this film as a bottom, as a total bottom, you know? <laughs> But no, it was about a lesbian high school fight club, which is just as good, I think, <laughs> if not better. Something that I really appreciated about this film is that these characters speak to each other like most of the queer women that I personally know. Now, I am not sapphic in any way. I am quite tragically very heterosexual, but most of my girlfriends are lesbians or bi women. So I have a lot of friends who are sapphic and it's always been kind of interesting to see the difference between like the women that I know in my life and the way that they're portrayed in media like this. I've noticed in a lot of lesbian films, and I guess you could say queer films in general, is that because they are so often made for a cishet audience, they tend to be really watered down, right? And you don't get like that sort of gritty nature that some queer people interact with each other, right? Like a lot of the queer women that I know have a certain way of speaking to each other. And it's a way where I think for a cishet person who have, who's only ever seen gay people like on TV, I think they would be shocked to hear it because I think when you have that sort of common watered down representation of queer folks, you can really easily get the impression that queer people are very easily offended because they, you know, speak a certain way, right? 
And I think that if you're a cishet person who has only ever seen queer people on TV, you might be shocked by the way that a lot of queer people speak to each other because it is often a lot edgier and a lot more offensive than I think people would assume based on what is often a really watered down representation that is intentionally watered down to be inoffensive to cishet people. Even though this film is camp and you're not supposed to take it seriously, I really did appreciate the way that these characters spoke to each other because it did feel more real than a lot of other things that I've seen. There's a lot of dark humor in this film. Um, there's a joke that they make about sexual assault that landed really, really well for a lot of people. And I know that the nature of that makes it controversial, but I guess the, the sense of humor that I heard in this film is close to the sense of humor that I've experienced from many queer folks, especially queer women. In several interviews, Seligman talks about using humor as sort of a coping mechanism for especially a lot of women living in the society that they do. Sometimes the laughing is the only way you can push forward. And I think the thing that stood out to me is that, yeah, this film was a lot edgier than I think a lot of other films we've watched on this channel, especially. Io Debris, who plays the role of Josie in the film, had this to say about the edginess of the comedy in Bottoms. We just really didn't want to punch down with Bottoms. So even if the jokes are towing a certain sensibility line, I don't think they're ever punching down. Humor is a weapon a powerful one, and it's also a balm, a salve that you can use to heal and even start conversations. Even though the film is incredibly campy, I really do appreciate the way that characters interact with each other because it really does feel really truthful. This film has a lot of unflinching verbalizations of sapphic desire. And I really appreciate that I was able to go to the movie theater and get a ticket to go see a film about two teenage girls who are out as lesbians who are pursuing relationships with girls. That is something that I think for a lot of people um, seems really simple right now. But back in the day, so many of the narratives that we had about queer people in high school were always about people sort of coming to terms with it or like working through it, keeping it from their parents, hiding it. You know, there was no like being out at school. It was always like this secret thing that you had to hide. And part of the narrative was that these characters had to ultimately overcome that to come out and be proud. And this is a film where instead of experiencing all that these two girls are out as lesbians and they are pursuing relationships. And even though maybe the environment around them isn't the most accepting, they're still able to do that and they're still able to maintain themselves as out lesbians in high school. And I think that is just so cool and a real sign of just how much we've grown and how we've progressed. Bottoms had a budget of $11.3 million and it made back $10.3 million. So it's not quite the box office success that I think a lot of people would have wanted it to be, but this film did make a lot more than some of the previous movies that we've reviewed. And we'll get into this more later, but I think that that is worth celebrating because this film unfortunately did go through so much trying to get made because of the nature of what the film is about. Overall, this film is being very well received. There's a lot of thirst for the character Hazel, who is also my favorite character from the film. Hazel is a character who is really quirky and she really likes blowing things up. <laughs> <laughs> She's like looking for an excuse every single time to blow something up. She was the character that I think I related to the most, honestly, because she was like the weirdo of the group. Like they're all weirdos, but she's the weirdest, you know? In so many ways, Bottoms was a true collaboration between Rachel Sennett, Emma Seligman, and Iowa Debris. All three of them actually met while studying at the Tisch School of Arts at NYU. Edebury and Senate were not a huge fan of the pretentious, artsy crowd at NYU. And so they wanted to find a community of women who were exploring gender performance and the very unique horrors of womanhood. And they were able to find that in the New York City alt comedy scene. Seligman felt similarly outcast as her program was full of a lot of like very very high art people, and she wanted to do more commercial work. Senate actually met Seligman when she auditioned for Shiva Baby, which was one of her thesis projects in school. 
Shiva Baby is a queer Jewish coming of age film and Rachel Sennett actually ended up starring in the feature film version of the film. And apparently right after they finished Shiva Baby, Rachel Sennett approached Seligman and said, hey, wanna write something together? And that's when Sennett pitched her the idea of writing a sex comedy for queer teenage girls. And Seligman absolutely loved the idea. So they started meeting every Wednesday to write what would ultimately become Bottoms. While writing, they put a huge focus on not shying away from the subject of sex. Seligman told South by Southwest that her motivation was to create a queer female teen sex story where the characters were not undergoing trauma, but also weren't these perfect, sweet, innocent beings. Senate added, female comedy, sometimes it's like the girl discovers a vibrator in the couch and they're like, oh my God, what is it? We're scared. I'm like, it's not that scary. It's blue. We all have six in the drawer. <laughs> it's just not that scary. And I just want it to go there and be real with that. Allison Small at Brownstone Productions read the script and really, really loved it. She loved how ballsy it was, and she would ultimately agree to produce it and start pitching it to several studios. The script went through dozens of drafts and apparently 20 studio rejections. One of the main reasons why the film went through so many rejections is that a lot of studios didn't believe that girls talked like this, and they were really sort of, again, turned off by the subject matter. But ultimately, it would be picked up by Orion Pictures and they would begin production in 2022. The film was made in a little over 27 days and they had a really, really hard time finding places to actually shoot it. They had planned to do most of the filming in New Orleans actually, which really, really surprised me. But the New Orleans Archdiocese decided to actually contact a lot of the places they planned to film and ultimately blacklist it from many of the locations. In addition, they weren't able to get any product placement for the film, which is a really big deal when you're trying to get a big film like this funded. And a a lot of the people that rejected them were indeed companies that, of course, every Pride year paint their social media with rainbow flags, which of course was really frustrating for everybody. Despite auditioning other people for the role of Josie, Ayo Adebri was always Seligman and Senate's first choice. Because Adebri was around for essentially the entire creation of the script, she felt really close to it and was able to have a really objective perspective and gave a lot of input. And I have to say that I was really, really happy to see her in this movie. Movie. even though this is kind of an ensemble film she is basically like the main character she's the character that you spend most of the time with and I thought it was really cool to see a black lesbian woman be the relative center of a large movie like this Alana Mayo is a black queer film executive and she greenlit this film and really, really believed in it, especially because of Ayo Adebri's casting. And according to Seligman, she was an incredible powerhouse for getting this film made. And she was particularly understanding of the film's horniness. Now Seligman is an out lesbian and Rachel Sennett and Ayo Adebri haven't exactly clarified what their sexualities are. In fact, during press tours for Bottoms, Adebri and Senate would regularly express annoyance at the fact that people kept asking about their sexuality. In an interview with New York Magazine, Adebri would speak about her frustration about these questions and would specifically mention the Kit Connor situation. Now, Kit Connor, for those of you guys who don't know, starred in a very popular gay romance series called Heartstopper, and a lot of people wanted to know his sexuality, and so he eventually sort of felt pressured to come out and he came to Twitter one day and said something along the lines of congratulations you have forced an 18 year old to come out as bisexual and a lot of people were really upset about the way that that went because Kit Connor felt like because of these questions he was forced to be out and Adebri just absolutely resents the idea of coming out on terms that are not her own. Adebri also has a Pentecostal background and she speaks about how her family would probably not be too happy about her being in this film. She also speaks about how her father at some point asked her if being in a film where she plays a lesbian would make it harder for her to get roles in the future. And you know, reading this, I definitely understood kind of the complexity of this. I think that the conversation about queer people playing queer roles is really, really complex. And I think that there's a lot of layers to it and it's gonna come up 
in every one of these videos because I think that everyone has an interesting take on this and I think that we're still working to that point. But I think that the, the frustration that some people have is we sort of see in a lot of the ways that Hollywood functions that there is something to be said about staying in the closet, right? There is something to be said about how complicated your life becomes when you come out as a queer person. And suddenly now that's something that people have to think about when they're hiring you. And, you know, as a YouTuber, I, I sort of have some experience with this. I have definitely noticed that because I have always been an out transgender YouTuber, there are certain people who just because I'm trans, even if the content is good, are not interested in engaging with it. And I sort of see it in some of my comments sometimes because I don't talk about being trans in every one of my videos. And sometimes there are people who will really genuinely enjoy my content up until the point where they find out that I'm trans. And I will see them, like, I, I see the progression of comments, right, with a really, really appreciated video. Then they get to one where I talk about being trans and suddenly it all changes for them. And so I think that there is something to be said about the fact that when you are a person who people can look at and assume is cis hetero, which of course I've done that through periods of my life when I was stealth, um, you do end up sort of, navigating around homophobia, navigating around transphobia. And I think that what a lot of people want to see, and maybe it's unfair to place this on the shoulders of these actors, is out queer people being able to get roles at, at bare minimum playing themselves, right? And I think that that is the piece that people are sort of frustrated by. And even when we talk about how this film was made and the complications that it went through to get made, it's really obvious that even though we might have progressed so much, there is still so much stigma behind being unapologetically queer, right? And so I think that for some people, this is one of those conversations that has layers, right? I don't think that anyone should be forced to come out or have to come out simply because of a role they're playing. I think that people should be able to come out on their own terms. And if you've listened to me talk about coming out, um, by the way, I'm filming this on coming out day, happy coming out day. You know that for me, coming out is something that I think you have to do when you're safe. And I think that maybe that definition can apply to an actor not coming out because they want to be able to work, right? I think, however, that it is interesting in a situation like this where we've got this film about two girls who are lesbians who are unapologetically queer and you kind of get sort of wishy-washy answers from some of these actors about their own sexualities, right? Like Rachel Sennett's response to this conversation is that anyone who went to school with her would know what her sexuality is, right? Like insinuating that while she might not be talking about it or identifying with it, that she probably has had experiences that people may consider to be queer, right? And I guess, even though I understand that, and I do think that their lives are private and nobody is owed that information, I guess it is kind of an interesting dichotomy when we think about this type of film and that sort of reaction, right? But I think this conversation gets really cyclical. There's a conversation about queer baiting that ends up becoming cyclical. At the end of the day, I don't think anybody should be forced to come out. And I think that everyone should be coming out when they are safe and on their own terms. Ultimately, this film was fun. It was silly, it was stupid, and it was about gay shit, and it went into the theaters and it made $10 million. I think that's amazing. I think that's worth celebrating, and I think that that is worth acknowledging. And that's kind of why I wanted to make this video, right? Like a lot of the things that we've seen previously are things that were not available in wide release, right? Like Monica only had a limited re release. Red, White, and Royal Blue was an Amazon Prime thing. This is a film that was in theaters. And I think for that reason, it's worth celebrating. It's worth applauding the fact that if you are a teenage lesbian right now, you can go to a movie theater and watch a film that fills the same sort of void that many other sex comedy movies filled for cishet people, right? And this is a film that is deliberately referential to those movies. This film is basically super bad meets, but I'm a cheerleader. And so it is a really, really fun time. It's really, really silly. And I think we need more films like that. I want more silly gay films. I want more silly films about women. I want more silly films about girls. I want just more silliness. More, please. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, I'm really curious what you have to say about this film. Did you watch Bottoms? What did you think about it? I'm really, 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 really curious what specifically the sapphic women in my audience felt about the movie. Did you like it? Did you have feelings about it? You know, there was a part of me that wanted to kind of talk about like how I guess it's really not okay that the premise is like they started a fight club in order to like touch girls or whatever. But like it's camp. I don't feel like taking it seriously. I feel like taking it seriously misses the point. And I, I just want more fun game movies. So hopefully this isn't the last we talk about on this channel. On that note, I want you guys to always remember and to never forget that you are beautiful and you are loved. And I'll see you next time. Bye.